There's certain centers. Uh, our next talk is going to be given by my um, co-chairman of the um, Translational Research Day. David Krizai is a research professor, and he's going to talk about some of the interesting work they've been doing on glaucoma and the treatment of glaucoma. So once we get you all fired up there, we'll go ahead and get you started. So, uh, co-chair that has been AWOL most of the time, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, slide a couple of hours ago, literally after I saw the title of the preceding talk. And the question is, what do these conditions have in common? They look pretty different in a way, but basically if we look at this, what they do have in common is some kind of a pathological stretching or swelling or pushing. So there is some kind of a mechanical thing that is going on. So, the what I would like to sort of address in this talk is can we find maybe unifying principles in all kinds of diseases that are afflicting the human bodies and, and can we find this through understanding a process that is called mechanical transaction? Uh, taking account that pretty much every cell in our body really cares about mechanical forces. If, if we look at the eye, for example, it is a highly mechanical act, mechanically active environment. So uh, I went to Arvo this year and there was a poster showing that just rubbing our eye or blinking or get, getting up from the bed increases our intraocular pressure to hundreds of millimeters per cubic. So uh, there is swelling going on, activity dependent swelling. There, there is pushing, there is stretching, there is the effect of hydrostatic pressure. So what I would like to leave you with is this idea of this being a highly mechanically reactive environment. Pushing uh, can cause uh, corneal opacification and so on. So uh, there are all kinds of pathological phenomena that have a very, very strong mechanical and uh, what we are interested in, many of them, perhaps most, but what I'll focus on is glaucoma. Basically, when we think about glaucoma, we think about two things. First of all, first is how is IOP regulated in the front of the eye? And the second thing is what is actually going on in the back of the eye? How do these cells sense pressure? Do they sense pressure or do they sense stretch or what is actually going on? This has been a million dollar question, thousands of papers have been published, and really we have gotten no closer to the answer. And this this is this answer is what we are looking for here. So how we do this connects the front and the back of the eye. The likelihood of developing glaucoma is exponentially related to the pressure that patients have. So there is something going on with the pressure, and indeed we can increase pressure artificially in the monkey and look at the retinas, and you see that the retinas looks, look pretty good except here. There is this huge loss of retinal ganglia cells. So these guys looked at the sensitivity of the monkey for light, and they found that the, the sensitivity loss was actually pretty minimal until the monkeys lost about 50% ganglion cells, which is what we see in humans. In other words, by the time we realize we are getting blind, it's already too late. So we really need a mechanism, I mean, we need to understand how, how this loss caused by the IOP occurs. What is the molecular mechanism? Because that is really the only way for us to diagnose early. And that allows us to treat those patients before this, this, uh, this uh, Fulcrum so the question here is what is actually going on in the ganglions? And 
the hypothesis in the field are actually uh, all over the place. Some people believe that retinal ganglion cells are intrinsically sensitive to pressure. Other people say, no, it's actually the glia. And it's the inflammation that kills the ganglion cell. Uh, there is a strong strain of thought suggesting there is an ex excitotoxic stress. Too much glutamate is being released for some reason. And some people say, no, it's actually endothelial cells and some kind of metabolic thing that is going on. And this is definitely the case for higher IOPs, which causes ischemia. Another really acrimonious debate that has been going on is whether the first effect of increased pressure is at the optic nerve head, or is it at the dendrites? And this is a very important question that, that, that still needs to be resolved. So how do we put all, the, all of this together? Uh, the hypothesis that I'll be talking about today is that all of these things are happening because these cells express ion channels that are sensitive to pressure or to all kinds of mechanical stimuli. We can mimic the glaucoma phenotype simply by activating these channels and we can protect the retina from hypertension by blocking these channels or by el genetically eliminating them from mice. So, so this is what we'll be looking for. And we are looking at several types of these channels. What I'll be focusing on today is a channel called transient receptor potential annular isoform form four, which is a member of a large superfamily of so-called trip channels. It's a non-selective kind of channel, and what is interesting about it is it, it's activated by all kinds of mechanical stimuli, from swelling, from stretch, but it's also sensitive to temperature and, and lipids, such as arachidonic acid. It's expressed all over the body, especially in tissues that are still load-bearing, uh, stretch sensitive, such as the bladder. It regulates uterine, vascular bladder contractions. contractions. And it's been associated with mechanical hyperalgesia during neuropathic pain. So something is going on with this channel and mechanical stress. And the novel mice were shown to be less sensitive to painful stimuli and to show less inflammatory responses during mechanical injury. So it's a very interesting candidate to evaluate in a mechanical force-related disease <coughs> such as glaucoma. So when we started, nothing was known about it in the retina whatsoever. So we looked at it, we find mRNA, we find protein, and when we immunostain, we find that it's very strong expressed in retinal ganglion cells. <clears throat> so the red here is a transgenic marker in retinal ganglion cells, SI1, and you see it very strongly co-localizes with trip 4 antibody. And the, the red here is another ganglion cell marker, and uh, you see it, uh, a transcription factor. It's, uh, so you see the only neuron in dissociated preparations that express trip 4 are retinal ganglion you also see this green fuzz here. These are the end feet of retinal Miller glia. So uh, we confirm this by immunolabeling with glial, a Miller glial marker. So why is this interesting? Because Miller cells and retinal ganglia cells are in fact the cells that are the most susceptible to some of the glaucomatous remodeling. So we can take a chemical that selectively activates trip 4 channels. And we can look at how, what, and we can load these cells with the calcium dye, and then we look what is, what is going on with calcium uh, signals. And what we see is huge calcium increases in response to this channel. And what is amazing to us and, and really interesting is that the pattern of the calcium response in the neuron, the ganglion cell, in the middle cell is, is extremely different. So here it desensitizes very quickly, and in the glial cell, the signal is huge and stays on for as long as the stimulus is gone. Now, what happens to the light response of these cells when we stimulate with this putative um, 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 mechanical uh, channel uh, agonist? So this we are recording an intact uh, retina, uh, whole mount. Uh, this is a cell that responds to light with spiking and uh, turns off during <coughs> light off and you see in the presence of the agonist the cell goes crazy. The excitability goes on like, like uh, it's turbocharged. 
we also see increasing spiking in a, in a cell type uh, that goes on with the light and then goes off with the light as well. So there, is all, there are also more spikes. And we, when we actually look at the excitability, which we test by injecting tiny amounts of current in the cell, getting spikes, we see that we need much less current to invoke induce spikes in the presence of the agonist than in the absence. In other words, what this agonist is doing, it is increasing the excitability, making them much more susceptible to any kind of glutamate or any kind of light stimuli that these, these cells are going to experience. So, producing an excitotoxic stress, basically. Now, this is the case for all ganglion cells because when we take the retina, we plug them to a microelectric micro array and we stimulate the agonist, we see a huge increase over 100 fold in, 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 in spiking that shows kind of a similar time course that we see with calcium energy. So, we are pretty sure that this channel activates excitability, stimulates excitability. What about swelling, which is another mechanical stimulus? Well, when we induce swelling, there is a huge increase in calcium as well. And we don't see it, so this is increasing calcium when we swell, and we don't see it in the mouth. Now, uh, are retinal ganglion cells, in, cells intrinsically sensitive to pressure? Here we record single channels in so-called patches, and we can stimulate with very, very defined, calibrated pulses of pressure, and we can induce spikes. And this is, this is very reliable. When we do longer pulse uh, uh, stimuli, we, we see, again, inward currents, which are much smaller in knockout animals or knockout retinal ganglion cells, or much smaller when in the presence of highly selected uh, trip before antagonists. In other words, trip before is a pressure sensor in retinal ganglion cells, and when we take it out, they are less sensitive to pressure. Now, can we mimic glaucoma or can we mimic sort of pressure induced retinal cell? Yes, simply by activating a mechanosensitive channel, the answer is yes. So when we inject the agonist, this is the control I this is the I injected with the agonist, there is a huge loss of retinal ganglion cells. So we can actually reproduce the mechanical phenotype simply by stimulating a chemically stimulating mechanosensitive channel. So what about this question about dendrites versus the optic nerve head. I would like to say that this is something that we are still in investigating right now. We don't have an answer to this, but when we culture cells and we, we can see the dendrites and we can get localized increase in the dendritic calcium level. So we are pretty sure that this is a way to regulate the synapse formation in the, uh, in the inner plexus from there. And the, the newest studies published in Journal of Neuroscience are showing that indeed the first changes in response to elevated IP may in fact be synaptic. However, when we look at the optic nerve head, the immunostanding is also extremely strong. So it's very likely that by stretching the lamina cribrosa in primates or the real lamina in mice, one would activate this channel. So we, we stretched the substrate. We have a machine that allows us to do that very specifically. We, we can see huge calcium increases in retinal ganglion cells that are la missing in about 70% of, 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 of cells. In 30, we still see some calcium responses. Now, uh, so the knockouts, knockouts show less uh, calcium increases. Uh, trip C1 knockouts, this is another type of mechanosensitive channels, uh, don't, are not uh, susceptible in trip C1 knockouts, but all of them are susceptible to um, the selective antagonists of trip B4 channels. So in other words, we hypothesize, we propose that trip B4 is actually a mechanosensitive channel that is sensitive to pressure that, and that is sensitive to stretch and that might ostensibly mediate the effect of hydrostatic pressure, both at the dendritic and uh, optic level. So this is kind of a, uh, a very simplistic model of what we're thinking. Uh, yeah. Overactivation by the of the channel uh, leads to overload with calcium, and this activates calcium-dependent proteases, uh, caspases, and so on. And we have proved that as well, and leading to something. So what about the second part? What about the glia? So 
the Miller cells in particular envelop every single retinal neuron. They are absolutely essential for every aspect of retinal physiology. And uh, what is interesting is that they become activated. The first thing that one sees uh, following IOP increase is glial activation to, together with the dendritic uh, so what goes on with Miller's disease? Uh, I will skip over a long period of time uh, of work, uh, a, a lot of work. I will just show that, that how incredibly strongly expressed, uh, present are Miller cells in the retina, enveloping every single retinal neuron. And if you look from the top, you see these little holes. This is where the, where the uh, cell processes are, the dendrites from the cell models and so on. So, uh, they strongly express trip before, and to just summarize our, our findings, we, we nailed down the signaling cascade that is associated with trip before activation. Basically, we, th we think that aquaporin 4 channels, which are the water channels, serve as detonators for, uh, for activating trip before channels by increasing the rate of swelling. Um, um, during kind of a, a, a osm osmotic shocks, but the, the trippers channels are intrinsically sensitive to stretch and mechanical stress as well. So um, we are 100% certain that trippy 4 channels are important uh, stretch sensors for everybody. Now, what about glaucoma? Uh, when we induce chronic, when chronic glaucoma in certain genetic model, uh, mouse models, or acutely elevate IOP by injecting microbeads in front of the eye, we can get reactive gliosis of these Miller cells. So the question is, can we reproduce this by activating this putative mechanosensitive channel? And the answer is yes. There is a, injecting this agonist induces huge reactive gliosis. So basically, in other words, we can reproduce the key as retinal elements of glaucoma simply by stimulating a mechanosensitive now, what about treatment? Can we, can we protect by uh, systemically treating uh, uh, mice with antagonists or by eliminating the gene? And the answer is yes. So this is a normal uh, eye treated with PPSD. This is eye that has experienced elevated IOP. You see there was a very significant degeneration about 20% loss of RGCs, which you see here. In, in mice that were systemically treated twice a day with a uh, high dose of trip before antagonist, there was no degeneration. We did this many, many times in, in dozens of mice, and we think this is a fairly solid result. So somehow blocking the mechanosensitive channel blocks the degeneration that we see here. Now, that when we got this result, we were very thrilled, but we started to worry that maybe the effect is actually not at the ganglion cell. What if we are regulating pressure itself as well? So we tested this by so this this is injection of micro B to see elevated IOP in, in in mice, and when we systemically inject the antagonist, you see that the IOP drops like a rock and stays down for as long as we keep injecting the antagonist every couple of days, a couple times a day. So, in other words, not only is strip before expressed in the retina, it is also expressed in the front of the eye and it's regulating IOP. Why is this fascinating? Because this would be a way to treat both at the same time, regulate IOP into neural protection. So, uh, we can get even a stronger effect when we intraocularly inject uh, inject uh, the antagonist, and you see this lowering lasts for days. We also designed eye drops here at the University of Utah, and these are also effective, uh, lasting for for day or two, so better than current eye drops. So, the important question now is where is this channel in front of the eye? Is it in the cellular body which produces the fluid? Or is it in the trabecular meshwork or the, the maxillary muscle where that mediate the outflowing? You see that trabecular meshwork is much more important because the higher you go with IOP, the more load is, is going through the trabecular, trabecular meshwork. 
Unfortunately, most of the current glaucoma drugs are tar targeting the lubrovascular component. So th there has been a very strong push of, lo of looking at trabecular targets. So we published two papers this year showing that it's expressed in both, very strongly. And we localized it to non-pigmented epithelial cells. And so we did a huge amount of work uh, on the molecular, physiological, uh, genetic kind of methods that I will skip over today just to make point it's expressed in both. But we are, we're more, we, for various reasons, we think the trabecular component is more important. So when we do so-called pressure clamp studies, we see that uh, pressure, the, that uh, trabecular mesh uh, cells are highly mechanosensitive, sensitive. So ramps of pressure uh, in both directions induce currents, inward currents. And when we stretch the cells, we see calcium increases that are blocked by the trp 4 antagonist. These increases are dose dependent. This is uh, statistics. But what is really beautiful, and here we were saved by a collaborator who can mimic the conventional outflow in, in nanofiber cated devices that have been populated with vertical network cells. You can, do, you can fuse through that, and this has been shown exhaustively by them to be perhaps one of the best in vitro models for conventional outflow. So basically, when we do that, we find that the antagonist is highly uh, effective in increasing the conventional outflow facility. So this would be really one of the first drugs that is uh, that might be targeting uh, the, the conventional outflow. Uh, in other, um, uh, in, uh, if you look at the pressure, perfusive pressure, on the other hand, the agonist increases it a lot. So this means that the 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 pores in this nano device are are um, much smaller because of activation of this channel. This is exactly what happens in humans when you increase the pressure, the trabecular metric cells become stiffer, the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix become upregulated, this increases the contractility which further increases iron. So is this the case in, in, in terms of trip before channels? The answer is yes, because we can stretch trabecular meshwork and you see the actin inside the skeleton and the focal adhesions get upregulated like crazy. So we can mimic what has been shown in human primate and animal glaucoma at the molecular level. So we lo also looked at these nano-device nano nano conventional outflow models and we see that um, the agonist, triple four agonist itself can reproduce the upregulation of actin and upregulation of exocellular matrix. And this is highly uh, suppressed in the presence of these uh, trp 4 antagonists. So uh, the model here is that increasing pressure in front of the eye uh, imposes some kind of a mechanical stress that activates trp 4 channels, leading to increased stiffening of these cells and conductivity, which increases outflow resistance and, and maintains or increases elevated value. So uh, what we're doing currently is we are nailing down the, the very kind of specific components of the cytoskeletal mechanism that link the internal cell cytoskeleton to the focal adhesions and to extracellular matrix. Some things go up during pressure and stress, some things go down. And another fascinating uh, approach that we are using is we use FRET probes, so fluorescent probes that function as force sensors. So basically they are stretch sensitive and by looking at changing fluorescence we can tell how much load is imposed on the cell as we are pressing, as we are pressing or as we are doing any kind of manipulation. As, as, you can, as you can see here, the load or the strain is mainly at the, at the focal adhesions. So this is, nobody has done really before that in, in the eye or, or the brain. So this is really an uh, exciting way to go forward. So I won't go into this, but this is what we're thinking is the mechanism that regulates uh, the outflow resistance at the level of trabecular metric cells. It involves uh, uh, CYP450 enzymes. It involves uh, calcium in gene expression. And uh, we have data for and for pretty much all of these components here. 
Now, to conclude, we think that uh, IOP, uh, the trip before re channels regulates IOP at both inflow and outflow levels, al although we think that the outflow component is probably more important. We think that they also regulate the uh, remodeling that happens during mechanical stress in glaucoma at the level of ganglion cells, the neurons, and glia. I didn't talk about microglia, they also have these trip before channels and they also are very stress sensitive. So, and combined, these these uh, events together function to induce the phenotype that we call uh, the glaucoma to speak. Uh, what is very interesting, if you look at this, this has very interesting parallels to the neuropathic pain paradigms that we see in other sort of force or mechanical dependent paradigms we see across the body, but they, they have different names, so we think they're different diseases, so to speak. So, uh, if I have just one couple of more minutes, I will tell you about some of our unpublished work, which I think is very fascinating as well. Because what I told you about endothelial cells that may be involved in glaucoma, but they also form the blood retina barrier and are critical for all kinds of other diseases, from, di from diabetes to ischemia and retinopathy of prematurity, macular degeneration, and so on. So we found that they expressed it before. Oh, yeah, first of all, just to show you, this is endothelial cell. It, it is enveloped by the pericyte in the case of microvasculature or smooth muscle cell in arteries, and that is shadowed by the end feet of endothelial cells. So this is called a gliovascular unit that is really responsible for the brain and for the retina to be able to function in any way. And when we, when we immunostain, for trip before, we see that endothelial cells very, very strongly express trip before channels. And in fact, what is interesting is that they're expressed in the uh, microvascular endothelial, retinal endothelial cells, but not in chorea capillaries. So, uh, different microvascular beds have very different uh, calcium or, or ion channel signatures, which we have explored, but I don't have the time, to, obviously, to talk about. One thing which is interesting is that the calcium increases in these cells are enormous. The, they are tenfold more sensitive to any other cells that we have ever investigated. Uh, when we look at the currents, when we, when we look at the calcium. So they really, really, really care about mechanical stimulation. So we, in collaboration with Dean Lee, here at the University of Utah, we can look at now a model of blood retina barrier by you doing uh, high profile impedance studies in monolayers of these microvascular cells. You see when we use the agonist, there's an enormous increase in permeability in vascular permeability, just like crazy. So uh, again, suggesting that these cells uh, really care about mechanical stimuli and the trip before channel is a potentially a major regulator of permeability. Now, we nail down, we believe, the molecular mechanism of this, so the, the permeability of blood retina barrier or the brain barrier is mediated by v cadherin beta catenin complexes and occluding complexes. And we found that trip before um, agonist triggers a retraction. This is this is v cadherin, this is beta catenin, I believe we're acting. Beta catenin, a retraction of these complexes towards towards the interior of the cell, which is directly correlated with increased permeability across these intercellular junctions. So again, this is something we are exploring very actively at the moment. And this is kind of the model of this gliovascular unit because the interesting thing here is that trip 4 is very strongly expressed in Miller and Fit and in the vasculature and we believe it's regulating and controlling the flow of metabolites and swelling, as well as pressure sensitivity uh, 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 within the retina. Now, when we treat any disease, we don't want to treat just any, any, any target within it. We want to choose the targets where many signaling pathways converge so as to treat several symptoms at the same time. So, uh, I propose 
that in terms of treating glaucoma, TRIP4 is a very convenient and, and reasonable target because, first of all, it's, it's expressed exactly, exactly in cell types that are most effective in glaucoma. It, it is associated with trans transductional mechanical forces and, and stimuli that are highly relevant for glaucoma. And by, by treating this or targeting this channel, we believe we could, we could, we could alleviate uh, a lot of the phenotype that is associated with the disease. Uh, here, I would just like to mention that all, most of these diseases that I, I, I plotted here, I plotted because I already knew they are associated with trip 4 dysfunction. Some of them with trip 4 mutations, which are associated with pathological load bearing, with sensory motor neuropathies, with neuropathic pain. I don't know about intracranial hypertension, but I would not be surprised, especially because the interact with aqua pore is very strong. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, we think, or I'm thinking, that uh, if glaucoma is just the, an ocular version of neuropathy, so to speak, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a semantic switch that perhaps we, we, we could make, uh, especially once we better characterize what is going on in terms of signaling and, 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 and symptomology. So, uh, TAM form was involved in pretty much all the aspects of the work that I was talking about today, and she is really spearheading the endothelial project and driving it with her ideas. Uh, the, everything was started uh, by Dan Riskamp, who was a grad student in the lab, and he kind of started this train rolling. Sarah is working on microglia, Oleg and uh, Maxime are electrophysiologists who have done absolutely spectacular work on mechanical transduction. I think this is really, uh, in terms of neuronal stuff, something that nobody has done, even in, in brain neurons, stuff that we are doing right now. Andrea is doing phenomenal work now on steroid glaucoma that I didn't talk about. Andrea, where are you? Yep. Here she is. <laughs> yep. So, and. Um, Andrew has been working on acoporins and swelling and stretch assays. And I have to mention here in public Dr. Olson because I am a photoreceptor guy. And I wouldn't be talking about glaucoma if it wasn't conversations <laughs> in support from Randy. <laughs> so who basically uh, said, go ahead to some of the crazier, crazier ideas that I had. And, and without that, those crazy ideas would go to nothing. So uh, I had no support when I started those studies and with, with support from Randy this, this actually started to roll. So thank you. Any disease 